Hello everybody and thank you for joining. In this session I'm going to be talking to you about how graphs can help you approach your data lineage projects. So what are we going to cover? Why is data lineage important and some of the challenges that we face implementing it? A brief introduction to the property graph database. Why and how graph databases are a great fit for supporting and being a part of your data lineage project and a high level example of how we might go about linking data. So why do we care about data lineage? Data lineage is an important component in many projects and programs of work. It helps to define the rules about how our master data is being created, processed and used. It helps us to understand what our data is being exchanged, what data is being exchanged and consumed. We want to make sure that reports and insights we derive from business intelligence is not being created from stale, corrupt or wrong data. Much of the regulatory compliances that organisations need to adhere to, such as GDPR, have data lineage components as a core part of their being and so forth. Essentially, all of these examples and more, we need to understand the data journey from its source to destination. We want to know how the data is being used and how it transforms. We also want to try and cut down on unnecessary data duplications and inaccuracies and so on. And there are a number of challenges that we face when we look to implement data lineage. For example, the business definition and the actual physical implementation can look very, very different. The data that we're looking at can be federated from different sources and coming from different applications across the estate. We may be extracting data, transforming it, transporting it and consuming it across a myriad of different systems. Often it can be that the field names that we'd expect and the field names that are actually being used are different and we can be looking at poor standards across our estate. There may be complexities as well in determining the original data sources and the copies where they come from. And we'll have other challenges as well, such as different levels of structured data being passed around, different sources and so forth. So we take on board these challenges and typically a lot of work will be taking place to make sense of this data and what's flowing through an organisation. And I suspect these these two images here will be familiar to a lot of you who have tackled these sorts of problems where we'll do a lot of mapping in some kind of a spreadsheet to describe what's going on and we'll have a data model as well talking about the interactions with this data. However, when we've done this, we will want to put this data in some kind of system and typically this will be a traditional relational database. And we start to have some challenges around this. So we need to have some assumptions, some hypotheses about the data and how it's going to be mapped and joined together. So some of this will come an input from this data model, but some assumptions we'll also have to make to pull them together. So we've done this, we've, we've got some thinking about how these elements are going to join and more likely than not, we'll have done some kind of normalizing or trying to uh, link down the data and we're then going to try and join all this data together to get some kind of a view of how it's all linked together. And this means we're going to have some computationally expensive joins to do as we have to do a look up across multiple tables and do all of these Cartesian joins to link it. And once we've done all of this, how do we start to figure out all of the pendencies on one field? So, for example, we may have identified that we've got a number of different customer identifiers for a customer. So how do we start to look at the dependencies across all of those? And again, we have to start making some hypotheses around this to be able to be able to work out what these joins might be. So at this point, I want to provide a high level introduction to a property graph database of which near for j is one to help describe how a graph database can help us with some of these challenges. So what we've got here our nodes and these nodes are objects in the graph they are our units of information and these can be labeled so here we have uh, 
two nodes that have been labelled as a person node, and here we've got a node that's been linked as a car node. We also have uh, relationships, and these effectively show how nodes are connected to each other. So, for example, here we have a, uh, a loved relationship between these two nodes, and here, for example, we have a drives relationship between these two cars. And we specify direction at the time of write. And direction matters if we want the direction to matter in a relationship. And last but not least, we have got properties. And we can apply properties to both nodes and relationships. And these are name value pairs that can be applied. And something I'd like to show here is with properties, you only need to put property on if there is a property to place. So in this example here, we've got this node and there is a property of Twitter, whereas on this node here, there isn't a Twitter account, so we've not placed one. So another thing I'd like to touch on as well is data modeling in the graph. And basically, when we come to modeling in a data model, the process is very similar to the journey we'd take if we were doing any other modeling for a data project. However, the key difference is that when, we've, when we're looking at the domain and we start to describe it, this is pretty much where we stop. So effectively, the model that we take away and start building against is going to closely match the domain that we're looking to model. And this means that we get to build out our solution faster but we also have flexibility in the model to iterate, adapt and change it. So, for example, when we start to identify that we have a new node that we need to add in or a new relationship type, we can add that in the model rather than having to think about how we're going to destruct it and rebuild it again. So we've, we've, we've described the anatomy of a property graph database. We've touched on very briefly how we go about modeling in one. So now I want to talk about some of the differences under the hood that's happening with a graph database like Neo4j and the relational database. So first thing I want to mention is the joins on right. And this first key element in Neo4j is that Neo4j treats a relationship as a first class citizen. So how the data is connected is just as important as the data itself. And under the hood, how this is manifested is as soon as we identify that there is a relationship between two nodes. So, for example, the customer node here and the first node, first name node here, we create this join and this join is created at the time of write. And this means we can forget about how we might want to hypothesis have how uh, units of information are joined. We take advantage of the fact of not having to remember it or know or try to figure that out. So that we take for granted. Another element of this is we have this sort of a hypernormalized view. And what I mean by this is if we have our unit of information, say customer here, and we want to use it in a different context or repeat it someplace else, we don't need to create a duplicate of that node. We don't need to repeat it or any kind of action like that. All we need to do instead is we just leverage another relationship of it. So we get this hyper-normalized view where we don't have any data duplication. We also have a flexible data model. And as I hinted at this earlier, as and when we get new information and our knowledge of our domain increases and improves, we can easily extend and adapt our data model to represent this without having to significantly rework our model. So just as an example here, if we discovered for system A here, there was a process said that we wanted to apply, we could add process said and extend the relationship in there, just as an example. And also, it's easy to query our graph with Cypher, which is near for js graph query language. And I'm going to show you some examples of this later. So let's introduce our high level example for this session. And here we have a situation where we're looking to understand customer. And in this scenario, we have this business, this organization, and everybody in the organization has this agreed definition of a customer. So for example, here, 
I've got the legal, one of the US legal definitions for a customer. So everybody in the organization has agreed, yep, this is what a customer is. And we've also agreed as an organization that these are the attributes or some of the attributes that we agree as customer. And this is common across the organization. So fantastic, we have this definition here. However, what the physical customer data looks like can be very different to the agreed view in the organization. And there can be a number of reasons for this. We may have multiple copies of the information due to legacy applications, or for performance reasons, we need to have this data cached locally. There may have been mergers and acquisitions and so forth. So there'll be a number of reasons why we have this data. And again, for the same reasons, we may not have standardization across field names, we may not have standardization across how that data is processed and so forth. And in our example here, we have this situation where we have three systems we've identified that have customer data. And as you can see that we've got different field names and so forth going on there. So how are we going to map this? We've got our business agreed definition where everybody understands and knows what it looks like. And we've got our physical data on the other side, which is reality of what data is flowing between and you know, actually fulfilling the capabilities that we need in the business. And what we're going to do in our simple example here is effectively we've got our, our graph model of what this is going to look like. So here we've got our business term or customer, and we talk about how it contains our attributes that we agreed, so the name, email address, and so forth. And then here we start to look at the databases we've identified where the data is, we've got the tables and the table fields. And effectively what we're going to do as we step through is we've got our customer, so we've got our business term here, customer. And then what we would do if we're building this out, we would create our the attributes, the business defined attributes for our business defined customer, and we connect them out with the relationships. And then what we can do is we can take our information from our physical data sources. So here we've got our databases, and then we know that these are tables that sit on these databases. So again, we create these relationships between them. We've then got the physical attributes, the fields on the tables that contain this information. So again, we show how they are linked back to these tables that are linked on these databases. And then last but not least, here we are connecting our physical fields with the sort of desirable fields that we would like them to be called. And we join it and very easily we join this. And again, we have these joins on right. And we're going to show you an example of how we can quickly query from customer and find out what databases customer sits on without necessarily needing to know this implementation detail. And some of you may have spotted as well that we have this situation where we had on one of our tables that we had uh, an F name and an S name field that provided name. And we may want to apply some kind of transformation to say that this plus this will give you this. And again, it's very easy for us to modify our data model to take advantage of this and be able to describe this. So straight away, not only are we describing how our business definition, our domain knowledge links to the actual physical data, but we can also start to draw how we are going to transform parts of the data and what is that journey of that data to create that. So another thing I want to touch on now to show you an example of is how might we go about asking some implementation agnostic questions. So what do I mean by this? So I want to be able to ask questions where I, I know this and I have a common view of what this looks like and I understand these definitions. And I may want to ask some questions about my data, but I don't really want to be worrying about how my business attribute is going to join to a field or how my business attribute is related to a database and so forth. I want to be able to forget about that. And because we have these joins on right, we can do this. And so, for example, if I wanted to ask a question such as what databases contain customer data as an example. So let's say 
I, some kind of uh, GDPR requests or such has come up where I need to be able to describe where all of my customer data lives. I don't want to be worrying about what are the different table names or the different naming conventions that have come across my organization. I want to be able to ask something simple like, well, I know what customer is. We as a business have defined what customer is. And I want to be able to use that point. And this example here, we're using uh, an example cipher query. And what we're effectively saying is, here's my start point. So here's my business term of customer. And what I want to know is what databases customer customer data sits on. And, I, and again, here I'm stepping away from the implementation, implementation detail of all the different fields and attributes I might have for customer. I'm saying, well, I need to know customer data. And I do this, and effectively what I'm doing here, and this is our syntax that we use for um, relationships. And effectively what I'm saying here with this pattern is, start at this point here, business term of known customer. So start here, my endpoint is here, so it's databases. Now, I don't know how many steps I need to take here, but I know the direction of my relationships in this way. So go from starting from at least one hop up to 10 hops, and the star basically says is variable, and, and 10 here is the limit. Just keep going through, and, as, and when you hit all of the databases where we have a start point of business term customer, please return them back. And here we've used the assumption that uh, name is our property for the database name here. So very straightforward. So we've not had to worry about the implementation detail of the different fields or transformations and things we needed to go across to get to our source of our customer data. How about going the other way? So I've got this, I've, I've got this uh, field in table field of email address. So it comes off a table in a certain database. So I know I've got a point here and I'm wanting to understand, for example, where where is this field being used? What business attributes are coming into it? So for example, we have a business term of customer and a business attribute of email, but what, for example, if we've got a business term of order and we decide we want to link email on there and so forth. So we're going in the opposite direction. So I'm specifying my start point here of the field name being email address. And I want to find out all of the business attributes that it links to. So again, I'm taking advantage of the direction of the, of the relationship. And effectively, we're going, to, we're going to push that back. And again, we're using this pattern of not worrying about all of the different transformations or links or filtering that have gone through to get back that information. And just one more example. So let's say, for example, I want to know all of the different fields that contain a customer's name. So again, same idea. I want, I've got this, I understand my business term of customer and from this business term of customer, I want to look at the customer's name. So again, we're doing the same sort of idea. And I've shown you three examples of a similar process where we're leveraging the fact that we created these joins at the time of write. So we're not having to hypothesize about how our different elements are joined. We take advantage of the fact that we did that joining as soon as we put that information into the database. And now we can leverage it to ask patterns. And these are very, very simple examples. And we can extend these out to start looking at rings, to start looking at sizing and so forth. So it's extremely powerful. So in summary, data lineage is a core component in many projects, and we've looked at some of the high level challenges faced in implementing it. We've also covered about how Neo4j can assist in overcoming some of these challenges through being able to easily model the data and adapt it as required. By having these joins at the time of write, we can move away from hypothesizing how data might be connected and instead just ask how it's connected. And we've briefly shown how Cypher allows us to query our data without having to worry about how it's wired. And with that, thank you very much for joining me today.